Hey, everybody, I'm Deb Gabor. I'm the author of Irrational Loyalty and Branding is Sex and the host of Brand New World. And I've been gone for a while. I took the summer off to do some personal things, but I'm really, really excited for this next series of interviews that I'm going to be doing on Brand New World. We're starting off this week with a fantastic interview with one of our beloved clients. And this is John Ratliff, who is the founder of Align 5, which is a strategic consultancy and co-working space in Westchester, Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. And he's the CEO of Scaling Up Coaches. And that's the capacity that we work with him in. He's also the managing director at STS Capital Partners. This guy is a true renaissance man. He's got his fingers in everything, has over 25 years experience as an entrepreneur, CEO, and investment banker. He co-founded Align 5 in 2013 in partnership with STS Capital to advise growth company entrepreneurs and family enterprises on a variety of strategic issues, including sell side and buy side M&A. And that's a lot about what we're going to be talking about today. And in his role at Scaling Up Coaches, John leverages his years of business experience and relationships with thought leaders to grow a dynamic community of coaches. And this community of coaches collectively advise more than 2,500 companies worldwide, including Soul Marketing. And we're a very, very happy client. John was also the founder and CEO of Apple Tree Answers. And if you've read the Scaling Up book, you've learned all about this, a telephone answering service company that he started in 1995. He grew the company organically by implementing strategies from the Rockefeller Habits 2.0, what we know today is the Scaling Up methodology. And through a series of acquisitions, to 24 U.S. locations and 650 employees. He sold Apple Tree Answers to a strategic buyer in June 2012. He's passionate about strategy, company culture, and employee engagement. And it was this focus on culture that drove Apple Tree to record to record growth and profitability, and ultimately drove a strate strategic valuation style exit. There's so much here to say about him. He's a member of the YPO Philadelphia chapter since 2007, the EO Philly chapter since 2004, and a graduate of the birthing of Giants class of 2008. He's also active in Virgin Unite, a charitable foundation created by Sir Richard Branson, John is an avid pilot with well over 5,000 hours in the air. He'd be somebody I'd feel safe flying with. And he currently enjoys flying his TBM 850 turboprop for both work and pleasure. So I want to welcome John in, like I said, beloved client, person that I've admired for a really long time. And I'm really, really happy to have you here. How are you? Hi, Deb. How are you? I'm great. <laughs> it, uh, yeah. So how did... How, yeah. How does it feel like listening to that long introduction? Like John Ratliff, this is your life, right? It's like nails on a chalkboard to me. There's nothing <laughs> worse than hearing all that. I had... Yeah, I have the same thing. And I, I often ask podcast hosts, I'm like, can you can you just let me introduce myself and let me tell you the high notes. But I had the whole introduction here. So I felt like I should, I should read it. Um, so a couple things that I want to cover here today, we only have a short time. And I know that this is a topic that you could wax poetically on probably for hours and hours at a time. But I want to talk about business exit. So my own experience with this in just being a member of the entrepreneurial community for many, many years is that sometimes the conversation about exiting a business or even thinking about or strategically planning for exiting a business, these things happen at really in ideal times. And I know back in 2018, I went to a seminar that was put on by an M&A firm just to kind of learn about planning for exit and business valuation and things like that. And that was after, at that point, 15 years in business. That was the first time that I ever personally thought about exit. And now it's something that is sort of on my mind. But when I ask my other entrepreneurial colleagues, like people in my forum and EO chapters and things like that, if they're thinking about about it, a lot of folks aren't. And so I'd love to start off just with a general explanation of in an ideal scenario for business leaders, what should they be thinking about? And what's the ideal timeline to be thinking about exit and preparing for exit? Yeah. So, <clears throat> you know, we all know the the business leaders that say, oh, I'm never going to sell my company. And, and in their mind, they think they're never going to exit. But 
the reality for all of us, literally every single one of us is we are all going to exit our business at one point. And it could be very intentional where we've thought it through and, and we've taken all the right steps and we've prepared, or it can be thrust upon us. And there's, there's kind of a cliche in, in our M and a world about the it's for some it's five, six, seven, but it's the five D's it's death, disenchantment, dissolution, uh, divorce, and there's more out there, you know. Is there like dismemberment, like you lose a part of your body or something? Yeah, yeah, dismemberment. (laughs) But, you know, you're going to exit your business, whether you pass it on to your family, whether you close the doors when you're done, you sell it to your employees, you sell it to a buyer, every entrepreneur will ultimately exit. And the time to start thinking about it, honestly, is the day that you've started the company. And whether it's you want to build a legacy business for the next 10 generations, there are activities and steps you're going to take to ensure that you can build a family company and a family legacy. If your goal is to build it for five years and sell it to a strategic buyer for a strategic multiple, there may be different steps and different activities that you take. But the earlier in the process that you think about exit, I think the better you are. There's a Chinese proverb that says the best day to plant an oak tree was 100 years ago and the second best day is today. So for anyone listening that is has not started the process of thinking about their exit strategy, literally the time is now. And not to be cliche, but the further ahead of it you get, the better off that you are. Yeah. So uh, in in my experience with folks that I've met, it's usually these in ideal scenarios where they're almost forced to think about exit in the moment, you know, some of those, some of those D's that you listed, or, uh, you know, they receive an unsolicited offer or something very suddenly shifts in their market. And there's an opportunity that comes up and all of a sudden they're forced in to the conversation in these in ideal situations. What, what are some of the things that people need to be thinking about? I know for me, you know, I've been approached before uh, where a, a buyer kind of came out of nowhere and just made me an unsolicited offer. And I was super not ready for any of that because A, I hadn't thought about selling the business. I didn't know what my number was to get out of it. I didn't know what relationship I wanted to have with this company long term and then also i wasn't i i wasn't ready as a human being to like let go of this big part of my identity what what are some examples of of these scenarios and what have you seen and what kinds of questions should entrepreneurs be really asking themselves well and you you actually touch on a really great point it in the best of times when you've thought it out in advance and you've prepared and you've sourced a group of buyers and you've created a soft auction where the buyers for your business bid against each other to get, you know, the, the best price and terms you can get. It's still in that situation, a highly emotional process. So you can imagine when it's a crisis or a sole buyer that's come along that kind of turns your world upside down with a number or, you know, any other number of scenarios where you weren't thinking about it in advance take all the emotion of the best of times and then compound it by factors in that scenario. So here's the really good news though, that the, the best things around governance and business structure and your operating systems and process and your financials, how clean and well-prepared your financials are, and how, how polished your executive team is at running your company. The most important, how redundant are you in the business, those things are all really important in terms of exit and they drive exit value. And I can run through kind of the, the real value drivers in exit, but they're also really important just in a, in a solid work-life balance and, you know, peace and happiness as an entrepreneur. If, if your business is chained to you and you're an 80 hour a week, you know, necessity there, your business is not going to be worth as much to a buyer as it would be if you were a 20 hour a week entrepreneur that had built systems and process, but you don't want to be an 80, unless, you know, work defines your life. You don't want to be an 80 hour a week workaholic entrepreneur anyway. So a lot of the things that we suggest to get ready. And when I say get ready, I don't mean get ready 
six weeks from now. I mean, prepare over the life of a business to get ready for exit. Those exact same things you should be doing anyway. So we really, you know, we prescribe getting out in front of those things. The, the being redundant in the business, probably the most critical. Focusing on your revenue mix, the more predictable your revenue, the more recurring your revenue, the more consistent year over year your growth is, the more your business is worth, but the better you're going to sleep at night as well. Your finances, you wouldn't believe how many entrepreneurs can't read a P&L, don't understand their balance sheet, forget a cash flow statement. And then someone comes along like you described, and I just worked through the situation recently with an entrepreneur where someone came along, unsolicited offer, looked really good on paper, and they signed an NDA and they shared their financials. And their financials were like their half-assed attempt, attempt at QuickBooks and diminished all the value in the deal. Then they got psychologically involved and emotionally invested in that is absolutely one of the things that happens is it's an emotional process and you get a number and all of a sudden in your mind, that's the number I'm going to get for my business. You start to think about how you're going to spend it or invest it or what you're going to do next. And as soon as you make that transition in your mind, you've given the buyer in a transaction all the leverage because you're now emotionally committed to an outcome and they can manipulate it you know, in subtle ways and you're still emotionally committed. So all of those things, having your books in absolute pristine order, they, they all are going to add to the, to the lower stress and higher valuation in the exit process. So we suggest getting on it literally. I mean, it, there's no good reason not to start right now with all that stuff. I think that that's really great advice. And just to kind of go back and repeat for everybody, you know, some of the drivers of value, redundancy of the leader, you know, making sure that the leader can be separated from the company, that the company can exist, operate, scale on its own without that person. I think that's one of the most difficult things for entrepreneurs, especially people who started their companies or they're part of a family business. I know for me personally, I have a very strong identity tied to this company. And I think about like, what would I be or what would I do if I didn't have my company as, you know, truly part of me, it's almost like a child. So redundancy in the business, making sure that you have systems and processes processes and an operating system for business where where things are very, very well documented. And I think I think what I'm hearing between the lines is like things need to be lather, rinse, repeat, that other people are able to operate that so that those businesses can live on long without you. I know that one of the most difficult things in my business has been translating the institutional knowledge that I held for the years and years before my leadership team joined the company and not being the only human being in the company who who, who has that, um, all, all of that kind of stuff. And then clean books, having, having clean books, I think uh, that's one of those things. I remember for probably the first 10 years that I was operating my business, I, I operated out of a, an Excel spreadsheet rather than having <laughs> outside help to help me organize it. Now I can say I have very, very clean books, pristine books where we don't mix any of the revenue or any of the expenses for myself personally, or any of my other businesses in with the core company and things like that. Um, I have this, I, I have this idea that my home I'm working in my home office right now that my home should be like ready for an architectural digest photographer at any moment that if they showed up on my front porch, I could invite them in, they could take pictures and I would be, I would be proud to show them my house. It sounds like the same is true of the business. Absolutely. I, and on the systems and process, you hit the nail on the head. The mantra at every company should be, this is how we do it here. This is, this is the process. This is the system. And you can hand that process to just about anybody. So to back up one step from there, put yourself in the shoes of a buyer, right? So you're going to take capital, capital that you have, or capital that you've raised from investors, and you're going to deploy that capital to buy somebody else's company. That is a risky proposition. You as the seller, as the entrepreneur, anything you can do to reduce the buyer's perception of risk is going to command a higher price. So the more consistent your revenue, the lower the risk. The longer term your customer relationships, the lower the risk. 
the lower the customer concentration. So if 80% of your revenue comes from two customers, one of those customers leaves, 40% drop in revenue, high risk. If the biggest customer is 2% of your revenue, low risk. If you're redundant versus not, lower risk. So always think about the risk profile and the risk tolerance of the buyer and everything you do should be to drive down risk. And yes, to your point on books, if you're paying your nephew's tuition and you have 11 cars running through the business and there's four people on payroll that mm, don't really work here, but they're family, the more you have to spend time explaining or defending, because you can normalize those things out. It's not like you'll be penalized for those things in a sale, but what will happen is you'll have your financials, then you'll have what we call normalized financials. So, yeah, you can take out if you have a company car, you can take that out. If, if you did some kind of business and personal travel that you deducted, we can argue for that and take that out. If your husband or, or wife or girlfriend or boyfriend is on the books and they are, are sort of part time and not really important, that can be normalized out. Every one of those conversations increases risk and diminishes the perception of value on behalf of the buyer. We're not saying don't minimize your tax burden along the way. Just know that when you get to, and this is a really important point, you run your business for income. So your business produces a profit, which is income for you. You're going to sell your business to create wealth, typically at a multiple of income. On the low end, it could be three or four times income. On the upper end, we've, we've seen deals as high as 20, 25. We're working on a deal right now that actually is going to come in around 70, 70, 70 times income. So while the income's important and driving your taxes down and all, all those things, the wealth event is the exit. So you want to make sure you're doing the right things along the way, not just to get the short-term benefit of lower taxes and those types of things, but to really paint a picture about how this asset, how this collection of assets in the hands of a buyer can produce future value for the buyer. The more the buyer perceives a future value, the more they'd be willing to pay for the asset today. And it's all about, as you, as you think about exit strategy, it's all about crafting that story for the future for the buyer. Now, an interesting thing, buyers tend to want to look at the past. So they talk about things like trailing 12 months, which is start today and let's look back 12 months or prior fiscal year. And in a growing business, if you're looking out the rear view mirror, that's not as good a picture as out the windshield. So you, you are going to sell based on the future. You're going to value yourself and, and pitch your company based on its value in the future. But a savvy buyer, in a, in a, this is in a growing company, so we're assuming your company's growing, a savvy buyer is going to want to value you based on the past. So the more you can do to create that future picture and get the buyer, it's as psychological on their, on their side as on your side. The more you can get the buyer invested in what the future looks like for them, the higher multiple, the higher value you'll be able to create in the company. There's a lot of friction between looking backwards to identify what the value of a business is on the buyer side. And then on the seller side, you're trying to project to them, this is what the business could be worth to you later. Going back to that example that you gave of the company that you're working with, that's like at a 70 times income valuation, what creates a scenario where you can command that kind of future value for an organization? So they've got a great growth story. They've got blue chip customers. You know, they have, they have some of the best customers you can find fortune 100 size companies. They have a great track record. Their executive team is absolutely exceptional. Their, their next level down, their leadership team is exceptional and they've been performing over a five year period. They, they invested a lot up front to build a great infrastructure. So they're a, they're a you know, middle market growth company that looks like a $500 million organization in terms of systems, process, predictability, infrastructure. So they've invested a lot to build this vehicle, to build this machine for growth. And there's a great story around growth. And that's, that's how you get there. So 
And again, buyers want they want to look backwards and say, well, prove it to me. But you get multiple buyers to come in and bid against each other. And you find the buyer that that buys into, believes and sees how they fit into that future story. So in this case, two of the buyers that are bidding against each other for, for this for this business, they know with their network and their customer base and their ancillary services that they provide by putting these two businesses together, one plus one can equal three instead of two because there's value fit on both sides. And my role as advisor is not only to help my client, the seller, see the value fit and help to value it. We also actually help the buyer. The buy, you can't assume the buyer is going to understand the strategic fit, the value driver. So a good advisor will, will work just as hard to help the buyer see those value drivers as much as the seller to see those value drivers. We use a term, and you're probably sick of hearing it, Deb, called Rembrandt's in the attic. So I want you to imagine, this is really, really, it, it's maybe the most important point I share today. All businesses have a financial value. So any MBA from any business school or any accountant for that matter can take your P&L, your balance sheet, your cash flow statement and create a discounted cash flow value for a business. It's simple to do and we can argue about the multiples, but every business has a financial value. The way to get outlier outcomes is to create strategic value over and above the financial value. And strategic value can come from a whole host of different things. In this case, it's ancillary products, customer list. We see a bigger future, one plus one equals three. And the concept of Rembrandt's in the attic is, if, let's say you're gonna buy a home, right? And, and the home's listed for a million dollars and three buyers all agree that that's the value of that home. But you, and only you, not the seller of the home and not the other two buyers, know that there's an original Rembrandt hidden in the attic. That Rembrandt has value over and above the value of the home itself. And if you know that and no one else does, you're going to be willing to outbid those other two buyers. Sophisticated sellers, I mean sophisticated buyers, are really good at finding those Rembrandts. And we find most of the time it's things that our clients take for granted. They're so good at it, or it's so fundamental in their business, or it's so core to what they do, they don't even see it as extra value. And they don't, they don't make the dot-to-dot -dot connection that, wow, if XYZ company owned my company with their customer list and their sales team and our service delivery, wow, that, that could be an amazing future. Or you know, we have this software product that we've developed internally, they could use it externally. Or in a, the case of a private equity firm, they could buy us as a platform to go out and use their capital to buy acquisitions and add on and add on and add on. We're worth more than we are from a discounted finance standpoint because of those value drivers. And there's, there's dozens and dozens more, but every business owner should be looking at what are the Rembrandts we have in the attic? What do we take for granted that's so fundamentally core that someone else would value way more than we value here? And that's, that's I think, kind of the, the first step in the process of creating strategic valuation. So are, are people making coffee in your office right there? What is yeah, there's a, there's actually some sort of weird construction going on. Oh, okay. Yeah. Like it sounds like you're right in the middle of the construction zone. Um, this yeah, idea of Rembrandt's right. in the attic, I have to talk about branding because, you know, I'm a branding expert. This is a branding show. And I, I'm curious about your point of view about what is the contribution of the value of brand to the overall capitalization of a company. You know, one of the things that we look at for public companies, which we work with a lot of public companies, and we also work with a lot of mid cap growth companies, and we're really trying to help prepare them by growing their value through brand. Uh, and we, we refer to a study every year that's called the Brand Z study, which calculates what is the contribution value of brand to the overall value of some of the biggest companies in the world. One of the things that we look at is like, who's on the top 10 or top 25 list? And there's a good mix of brands on there. You have your, you know, Apple, Google, Amazon, Facebook, Microsoft, 
you know, Alibaba, Tencent, like sort of the usual suspects of global brands. But also if you dig down deeper into that list, there's brands on there, like say for instance, Marlboro, who even smokes anymore, but there's this incredible value uh, extended by the brand. And it's not just consumer brands, there's also business to business brands, brands like Salesforce, SAP, Oracle, like some of my favorite brands are, are really, really unsexy brands that, that can the brand itself, like the relationship of the brand. So customer loyalty, awareness, uh, you know, consistency, things like that contribute to the value of the company. What are your thoughts about the value of brand, especially for mid market companies? Yeah. So in my opinion, brand really gives you two things or, it, it, it drives two drivers of value creation. Number one is pricing power. So great brands have the ability to price better than their peers. One of the biggest things you can do to drive value in your business is to outpace your competitors significantly around gross margin. So you, you look at Apple versus, you know, Microsoft, you look at You look at Salesforce versus HubSpot. Mm -hmm. They have pricing power because of the brand and service delivery and other things. The other thing really strong brands can do is drive down marketing costs. So word of mouth, obviously the most effective and, and inexpensive form of marketing, great brands drive great word of mouth. So that one of the, so the hidden, there's, there's a, there's a hidden secret value driver in companies that nobody talks about, but I can promise you, especially savvy private equity, it's the first thing they look at when they get your financials. So everyone wants to talk about revenue growth and profitability growth, right? That obviously that's, you know, and revenues, vanity, profit, sanity. We've all heard these stupid cliches, but yes, revenue growth is really important. Profit growth, is certainly important, but profit growth is pretty easy to manipulate. You, know, you cut back on marketing expense, you change the mm -hmm. timing on things. What nobody talks about, but what really drives, what, what will get a savvy buyer really excited is when they see revenue growth and they see gross margin growth. So revenue minus the direct expense of providing a good or a service is gross margin. They see revenue growth and gross margin as a percentage of revenue increasing. So if, if you go from 20 million to 30 million in revenue, and at 20 million, your gross margin was 53%, and at 30 million in revenue, your gross margin is 55.5%, that will light up a savvy buyer. And they won't talk about it, they won't ask about it. I mean, they, they'll ask around it. Um, they don't identify it as one of the things, you know, in, in the negotiation, but what they wanna know, and that's about the future versus the past. Anyone, well, it's easier to grow revenue at the expense of gross margin. You can invest more dollars in sales and marketing, you can bring on more salespeople, you can lower the price to drive revenue. But if you can really expand margin as a percentage of sales while expanding sales, that is an engine that you can throw gas on and grow and grow profitably. So from, from that perspective, if you have really strong brand, you have pricing power, you can drive down some of your marketing costs. You can drive some of your direct operating costs down. You can expand gross margin as sales grow. And that's where absolutely comes in. Yeah. Well, thanks for saying that. Um, cause that definitely is, you know, it, it makes a good case for branding for companies of all sizes. You know, we're I'll, into I'll this. Just one more, just one yeah, more go ahead. quick thing on brand. And this is like, and you may, now you may say, I hate you for saying that, but I think <laughs> brand great brands drive employee engagement and mm -hmm. companies you look at Starbucks and their their ad spend relative to revenue they spend all of their dollars to create this most of their dollars to create the Starbucks brand internally by getting their employees to fall in love with their brand and then the employee delivers the brand experience and the rest is history a lot of companies spend very high levels externally on brand and don't have good employee engagement internally with the brand and all those dollars are wasted. So if your employees can deliver on your brand experience because they love the brand, they're willing to tattoo the brand on their arm at Chili's or, you know, Starbucks or whatever it is, Harley Davidson, the biggest one, 
then I think those two in concert are massive value drivers. So that's my rant on employee engagement. Well, I agree with that wholeheartedly. And it just speaks to, I met um, uh, one of the people who who is a leader of brand at the Chick-fil-A Corporation when I was speaking at a CMO summit a couple of years ago. And he gave this presentation where he, he said that our entire strategy for branding is cared for people, care for people, that they invest significantly in enhancing the employee experience. They spend more on making it more palatable for employees to stand out in the cold and take orders via iPads, you know, through the drive through just making those employees comfortable than they do in actual advertising. And um, I really, really believe in that. One of our mantra as brand strategists is to say that actions speak louder than marketing. And you have to focus on that internal audience first. And you want your employees to feel like they have b- bragging rights for working for your company because they are the first line to your audience. So 100%, I totally agree with you. And you can build a brand without doing a significant amount of external marketing if you ignite that employee population to actually carry that message through their actions. One last thing about brand, and then I, then I have some other questions for you. One last thing about brand that I, that I always think about is that the best brands in the world aren't just different. They're unique. They're singular and, and legendary brands are top of mind brands. You mentioned word of mouth, and I think word of mouth contributes to something that we refer to as top of mind awareness. When you assume the role of being the top of mind brand in your category, when you're the first brand that people mention off the top of their head, that is the strongest predictor of whether or not a brand will be purchased. It's been modeled in every category, every market of the world, B2B, B2C, every size company. If people can mention your brand off the top of their heads that they have strong category association. So when you think about CRM, SaaS-based CRM software, Salesforce comes to the top of your head. When you think about I always give the example of of canned soup that you can buy in the regular grocery store. It's Campbell's, right? Who takes up most of the shelf space in the regular grocery store? So striving for top of mind is, is really part and parcel to branding. And then when you have that brand, then people will pay a premium, like brand equals margin. So um, I love what you're saying about that. I want to go back to... um, Thinking about planning for exit for folks who are entrepreneurs and leaders in in growing companies. And uh, at the very beginning, you said something about, you know, the best the best time to plant an oak tree is 100 years ago. And the next best time is right now. So from this point forward, as entrepreneurs, what are the things that we need to be doing to prepare for exit? every day, every week, every quarter? Yeah, so the first thing you can do is have your clients go back or if you're listening to this, and it's a fun exercise. Grab your grab your leadership team or if you, if you don't want to share at that level, do it on your own, but just make a list and you want to cast as wide a net as you possibly can. Make a list of who might value this company over and above the cash flow. And I want you to think really broadly. So we had a, an e-discovery company, which is uh, it's law firms use it to capture emails. If there's going to be a big lawsuit, you have to go back and get three years worth of emails. And so this is a service that helps you. So it's like that. archiving and search and probably yeah. involves AI technology and stuff like yeah, that, right? Exactly. Yeah. A boring tech enabled service company. It, it should trade for seven to nine times EBITDA you know, in in most cases, Um, we took them to market, we ran a really wide process, and we thought about all of the potential buyers who might be strategic. Walmart actually came up on the list. So why in the hell would Walmart want to own an e-discovery company? That was the question I asked when they responded to our teaser. Turns out if if Walmart was a law firm, they'd, they'd be one of the, if their legal department was a law firm, be one of the largest law firms in the United States. Walmart gets sued every six seconds. So <laughs> this e-discovery company was a huge expense on their on their legal department line items. And if they owned it, then they could own it internally and probably save a lot of money just by owning this e-discovery company. And then, yeah, they could use it and farm it out to others and make it a profit center, not a cost center. But we cast a really wide net to think about 
Walmart as a prospective buyer of an e-discovery company. When you do this creative process, be really broad and it's it's a fun exercise. Who might value this business over and above the financial valuation? So that would be step one. And then start to think about the why. So what are the Rembrandts? Do an inventory of the Rembrandts in the attic. And I think that's the most important part of all. And again, beginner's mind. If you take it for granted and you are so good at it, and more importantly, your competitors can't copy it, and it's your secret sauce, that has a lot of value. Just catalog those things. And this is really important. What mattered to Walmart about this e-discovery company was totally different than what mattered to the ultimate buyer. By the way, we sold that company for over 20 times EBITDA because we found a strategic buyer and their puzzle piece was a perfect fit. And that's a whole nother hour discussion I won't get into now, but we found the strategic buyer that found that one Rembrandt that was worth 20 times EBITDA when the market said they were worth seven to eight or nine. So do an inventory of your Rembrandts and just start thinking about who might value this strategically. So those two exercises, super fun, creative, kind of a good thinking exercise for your team, or if you don't want to share it with your team for you as the entrepreneur, and then just take a look at your stuff. Are your books in order? Your employment agreements in order? Your customer contracts in order? Your governance? How's your leadership team? Just take an inventory of the business and where you are. And then for the really serious entrepreneur that wants to get, so you, you made the perfect point. Someone shows up out of the woodwork and they make a silly offer and you get excited and you're not prepared. Well, you might as well be prepared. So there's a process we call reverse due diligence where you get a CPA firm or, or you get you know, a firm that does due diligence type work and just run a due diligence on yourself. You never wanna find anything in a sales process second. You don't want the buyer to find something you didn't know about ahead of time. So when we have clients that are actively going through the sales process, we run a diligence ahead of it because we wanna find the skeleton before the buyer does. There's no reason not to do it now and that due diligence will give you a checklist of things to do to get your stuff in order. Should that you always want to be ready. If someone calls to say, have you ever thought about selling your company? Yeah, I, I think about it all the time. I know if I get my number, I'd be happy to go. And if I don't, I'm happy to run it for the next decade and I'm happy to talk. Now we advise if you're going to have a sole source buyer, then you should probably run a short targeted process and at least get some other buyers to keep the sole buyer honest. You never, you can do it, but it's tough to have one buyer and that's it. The other buyer has to be, I'm just going to keep running the business. There has to be competitive tension between a sole source buyer and something. It should be other buyers, but if not, it's your apathy and you're going to run the business, you know, continue and you're not going to sell it all. But yeah, it sounds, it sounds a little bit like dating, um, <laughs> you know, the, the, yeah, the whole idea yeah, because you know, if you're if you're dating three people or four people at one time, there's less of an air of desperation and and less of an inclination to make poor decisions just out of out of a fear of dying alone. Um, so so yeah, I mean, it yeah. it sounds it, it I, there's sage advice in there for sure. Yeah, and if if you know if one buyer gets you emotionally committed to an outcome and they know it the instant they know it the whole leverage calculus changes they know that they've got the leverage so don't answer questions like hey this is a lot of money we're talking about what kind of boat are you going to buy or what kind of vacation <laughs> home are you going to buy and deb i've watched it in fact i see it almost every time i sit across the table from a sophisticated buyer they ask those questions and they're they are actively trying to get our seller to already envision the sale as if it's already happened. Run your business like you're never going to sell it right up until the day. Contract signed, the ink is dry, the wires clear the bank. And if you have an earnout, keep running it that way throughout your earnout period. Because as soon as you're emotionally invested in the outcome, the buyer has all the leverage. And they're good at good. it. It's, it's yeah. more competency for them. And it's painful to watch. We talked a little bit previously about why do I do this? It's a mission for me to protect. It has gotten so unlevel 
playing field for entrepreneurs versus sophisticated buyers that literally hundreds of times a day, entrepreneurs are totally being taken advantage of by buyers. Hundreds of times every single day in the United States, entrepreneurs are selling companies for significantly less than they're worth because a sophisticated buyer used a sophisticated playbook complete with the psychology part and they're taking advantage of sellers. And it's my mission. I was lucky I had a great strategic outcome and it's my mission in life to help entrepreneurs avoid the trap of getting taken advantage of. Well, and it sounds like you have the right background for that, having been both on the on the acquisition side as well as you know on the on the sell side. Um, just to have that perspective of having been a buyer and a seller, and you know all of this great experience, plus working with I perceive like probably what thousands of companies at this point, yeah. you know, through your yeah. career, um, you have such a wealth of information to share with people. Uh, entrepreneurship sometimes to me feels like a solo sport. You know, it is one of those things that's really hard to uh, find the right kind of help and inspiration and information. Uh, you know, in thinking about planning for exit and increasing the value of the company and, and being prepared to avoid making poor decisions or being taken advantage of in this process, whether it's something that you're planning or, you know, something that's one of the unfortunate, what are they, the seven Ds, um, where can people get help for this? Who should, who should they reach out to? Who are resources that are available for them for everything from increasing the value of their business and helping them deal with some of those value drivers, which sound to me like everyday living in my business world, but for other people are probably not. Uh, and then yeah. all the way through like getting assistance on, on M&A stuff. So, I mean, obviously I'm biased because, you know, we own the Scaling Up Coaches Organization. It's 200 world-class coaches around the globe, literally on five continents, teaching 2,500 plus entrepreneurs every day. Just getting the fundamentals right, I think that's a great place to start. And whether you work with a coach one-on-one -on -one or you just kind of come part of the community, read the book, Scaling Up, I mean, that'd be a great place to start. And then on the advisor side, I think you can start small. You, you probably have a CPA and you want to get your books in order. You, you probably have you know, a, a lawyer, you want, you want to get your employee and customer contracts in order. Like you can, you can certainly start small. I think great exit strategy is a mindset. So the, the best place to begin is getting the mindset, right? That we're all going to exit. Let's get prepared ahead of time. Let's get our house in order. Let's do the fun stuff and think about, you know, the creative side, who's going to value it. Certainly down the road, an M and A advisor, I, Again, I'm super biased because I own the coaches organization and I'm an M&A advisor, but going it alone, I think, I mean, I often get called in at the 11th hour where it's already pretty far down the path and I, don't, I can't have a ton of impact, but even then I can, I can normally see half a million, a million, two million, $10 million left on the table that we can at least try and get some of it back. And we do. When, we see it, it. Lawyers don't represent themselves in court. Doctors don't give themselves their own health care and surgery. Um, trying to do M&A on your, on your own is really tough. And especially if you're going to sell to a buyer and stay on as a partner, because it can get contentious. You need to be able to say, hey, sorry, I know that got really heated. That was our M&A guy. He's kind of a jerk. Um, sorry about that. And, and we can make it right. I get to play bad cop a lot, <clears throat> which is funny because I'm normally a pretty nice guy. But when I get on the bad cop, cop side, which is often, I know exactly the moment with most buyers when we've, when we've gotten all we're going to get. And <clears throat> it's normally go blank yourself is the buyer telling me like, that's it. There's no more you better not come back another time. You can't do that if you represent yourself and you're going to stay on, right? Because as soon as they're that mad at you, that the partnership's over and there's animosity. So I'm a, I'm a believer in, in getting help. And that's not a pitch for me. That's a pitch for mm -hmm. any good advisor out there, um, any good deal attorney, any good CPA firm. But, you know, if you want to do it right, you, you don't want to play amateur hour, you, you should try and have help. All right. Well, this is this has been a great conversation. I know that you could 
go on about this. I have still a million questions and we'll probably have to have you on like for the advanced course in this. Um, but this is John Ratliff, nice guy, bad cop, M&A advisor, CEO of the Scaling Up Coaches organization, beloved client of ours. Um, how can people get in touch with you? So align5.com is our website. I'm Jay Ratliff at align5.com. Not too hard and um, happy if you want to post my cell phone number, I can give it to you now or you can do it in post, whatever. whatever yeah, like we'll do, do we'll, but... we'll do that later. Um, if I know my audience, they're going to be reaching out to you. Um, yeah. So, you know, hopefully, hopefully you'll, you'll get some contact from people who are interested in this subject and interested in, in getting resources. I know on the Align 5 website, there are a lot of resources and blog posts and information there. Uh, anything else that you, you want to tell folks, anything I haven't asked you that you think is important for people to know? You know, I'll, I'll summarize it really quick. Number one, put yourself in the shoes of the buyer from a risk standpoint. The more you think from the buyer's perspective, the better prepared you'll be. Number two is just get your stuff in order and be ready. Be ready for it because it, it could come out of the blue. You know, a, either a chaotic event or a buyer shows up. And number three, really get the mindset right. Who Who would be, you know, who would be a strategic buyer? What are our Rembrandts? What do we want? We didn't even talk about valuation. And it's more than the number. It's it's a whole slew of things we can do that in a 2.0 session, Deb, if you want. I'm happy to walk people through how to think about how to come up with their number, how to think about their own value prop and what they want out of a deal. And But know that going in so that you can, the more, the less emotional it is and the more rational you can be throughout the whole process the better your chances of a good outcome. I love that. Thank you so much. And thank you, John. Like loved having you on here. Um, we've got a couple of upcoming brand new world shows coming. One with Dr. Tanisha Wards, who is uh, somebody that I mentored in, an, in a startup accelerator. Uh, she's got a great medical practice. Uh, she's a chiropractor by trade, but she has a medical practice where she's really focused on holistic wellness. And uh, when you talk about work-life integration and you talk about uh, the whole entrepreneur, like physical health is definitely part of that. And then also another, another guy that I mentored in an accelerator, Brennan Bliss, whose company is called Pixel Cut Labs, and he's going to teach us all about SEO. So, so John, thank you. Have a great week. Thank you for listening and watching everybody. Be good. Be good to yourselves. Have a little fun. Uh, and, and make sure that if you're an entrepreneur, you're a business leader, that you are thinking about exit from here on forward. Today is the first day of the rest of your life. So I know that I will be thinking about this all the time. So thank you again, John, and we'll see you on the next brand new world. Thanks for having me, Deb. I appreciate it.